Hello, and welcome to this service of worship with Church of the Holy Comforter. I'm the Reverend Joanne Tatro, and this is the seventh Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose sight not of things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord said to Abraham, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? S suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he answered, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him. Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to him, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, oh, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his pers persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receive, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each one of our hearts be always acceptable to our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Noted psychiatrist Carl Jung was a pioneer in early psychoanalysis. One method he used with his patients was to help them to interpret their dreams in order to understand themselves. Jung believed that dream images revealed something about yourself, about your relationship with others, and the situations that you're dealing with in your waking life. And so he would ask the dreamer to imagine that he or she was a different character in the dream than the person first thought. Indeed, Jung would say that you are in fact every single character in your dreams and that the dream provides a place where different aspects of your psyche can be played out. There's a, a dreamlike quality uh, to the story of the the three loaves that follows on the heels of Jesus's teaching of the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps that's because the, the story takes place in the darkness of night, involves the, the waking of one of the characters or more of the characters from, from deep slumber. Imagine instead of hearing this passage, you suddenly remembered dreaming it, that you needed bread to feed a friend who had arrived late at night and you're out. And so in your dream, you, you go to the door of another friend to ask for three loaves of bread. Now, the friend, the man with the bread, without opening the door, tells you to go away, that he's in bed with his children and can't give you anything. But you're persistent. You stand at the door and you, you knock until he gets up and he gives you what you want. And so if we think of the parable of the three loaves as a dream, Imagine that you are not simply the person who goes to the door and knocks looking for bread to feed a hungry guest, but you are also the man who arrives late at night, who's, who's hungry. You're also the sleeping man who has the bread to give but wishes to remain in bed. And beyond that, you're the child who's awakened by the commotion at the door, listens to her father as he first tries to convince his friend to go away, but then relents and agrees to give the friend what he needs. And so a deep imagining of ourselves as different characters in this dreamy parable, I think it can tell us a lot about who we are in our waking life. Perhaps we're the person in need, 
the one who needs the bread, or, or the friend who goes next door who pleads on behalf of others, or the one who has much to give with the need to first be shaken awake. Or maybe you're the child who listens helplessly as life's drama unfolds. At each time in our lives, I think each of us has been hungry for something. We've pleaded on behalf of another. We've refused to give or giving freely from our abundance or maybe just sitting helplessly on the sidelines watching life pass us by. Such is the story that Luke chooses to place in the middle of Jesus' teaching on prayer. And so why would that be? I don't think it's simply because Luke wanted to express to his readers something about the value of persistence in begging. This isn't a parable telling us that if we pray hard enough, we're going to get what we want. Nah, that, that's not how prayer works. It is, I think, telling us something much more profound about the nature of prayer. In prayer, we find ourselves residing a, in a network of connectedness, deep connection with the heart of our own being and our most basic needs, our deep connection with others and with the source of all, an acute awareness of others' needs. And then it's a movement towards a willingness to, to rise from our slumber and awaken to the hungry friend that knocks at the door. And so in prayer, we, we begin to learn who we truly are and what our true relationship is with all of creation. And it's in that awareness of our, of our interconnectedness with, with all of creation that I think will ultimately stir us to compassion. And so praying with an awareness that we are one with creation it prevents us from simply asking that God's gonna do something about our, our looming climate disaster, the rise of white supremacy or the mistreatment of immigrants. Jesus' prayer teach us that we must first ask for forgiveness, forgiveness for the role that we played in climate change, systematic racism or our failure to fully welcome the stranger. And the prayer teaches us that we can't simply ask God to give us our daily bread and ignore the woundedness of our, of our planet or the cries of the world's hungry and the pressed. Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. You see, Christianity is not a passive religion. We're not called to sit back and wait for the kingdom to come. We're being taught to summon it. Thy kingdom come. That's why it's not enough just to pray with words. It's, it's not enough to quietly ask God for peace, expecting nothing to happen. And when nothing does, submissively going on our way. If we pray for peace and then allow our leaders to abandon peace treaties and accelerate you know, the arms race, we, we pray in vain. If we pray for justice and do nothing on behalf of those who struggle to, to earn a living wage, justice will not prevail. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, in reference to his 1964 march alongside Martin Luther King Jr., he wrote, many of us, for many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about protest and prayer. Legs are not lips, and walking is not kneeling, and yet our legs uttered songs. Even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. It's a mistake to use the prayer, God's will be done, as an excuse for doing nothing. If we think we can kick back and let God take care of creation, and all the issues that we have, then, then we're practicing the wrong religion. True prayer, it's not flattery or bargaining or bullying or begging. Prayer takes us on a journey of an ever deepening awareness of ourselves, our true selves, of others, and ultimately all of creation. And it's that awareness that enables us to awaken to the realization that, that God is the thread 
that weaves it all together and brings us together into a world of wholeness, of shalom. Ask and it'll be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Or in the words of the African proverb, when you pray, make sure you move your feet. Amen. High and holy God, robed in majesty, Lord of heaven and of earth, we ask that you bring justice, faith, and salvation to all peoples. Let us pray as one body by responding to Together We Pray with You choose us in Christ to be your people and to be the temple of your Holy Spirit. Fill your church with vision and hope. Together we pray. Your spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father, affirms that we are fellow heirs with Christ and pleads for us in our weakness. We pray for all who are in need or distress. Together we pray. In the baptism and birth of Jesus, you have opened heaven to us, enabled us to share in your glory the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before the world was made. 
May your whole church, living and departed, come to a joyful resurrection in your city of light. Together we pray. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>